Hi, and welcome to our overview presentation on the case study of the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster using the PROACT RCA software. Let's first start with a few slides about the anatomy of the Challenger disaster from an orientation standpoint. Okay, the mission was Mission 51L, and this occurred on January 28, 1986. If you look at the graphic here, the center uh, vehicle is the main fuel tanks which is liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And then to the left and the right of the main fuel tanks, we have the left and the right solid rocket boosters, which I'll refer to as the SRBs. On the right SRB, you'll notice that we have a magnification showing a red line here, which is the right aft field joint. Uh, this is where the leak actually occurred, which forced the separation of the strut uh, to the vehicle which is in the center. This is actually the crew cabin in the center here with the wings removed so that we could see the SRBs. So what happened we will see in the next slide is that 66 seconds after launch uh, the fuel had begun to leak out of the uh, right aft field joint and it was burning at a temperature of about 5700 degrees Fahrenheit and it severed the strut holding it to the main fuel tanks. As a result of that, it stretched out to the right and it forced the top of the solid rocket booster to pierce the main fuel tanks. If we look at this and we try to uh, dissect the solid rocket boosters, uh, what it is, they're, they're about 150 feet tall and they're about 12 feet in diameter and they are brought to a stacking facility at NASA where they are stacked on top of each other via a series of what is called tang and clevis joints which is over here to your left. Now you'll notice the gray ring in each of these is the solid rocket fuel which is caked in in the form of a donut so that the fuel actually burns from the center and then burns out. Now this tang and clevis joint had a design flaw to where uh, when the SRB was pressurized it would actually bend out allowing this joint to expand and leaving an airway to the primary and secondary O-rings right here located in the red. Now there was another form of protection in here which is an insulation in the form of a zinc chromate. So the gray here is the propellant, the zinc chromate was a line of defense these are the uh, primary and secondary o-rings which failed uh, so as the fuel was able to get out go through the tang and clevis joint it reached the strut and then it burned through now this is another cross-section of that joint to be able to show what we refer to as the nitrogen port this was a test port so that prior to launch they could ch test the primary and secondary o-rings to make sure that they were seating properly and that becomes pertinent as we go through the logic tree. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I want to go through the logic tree of this and we'll be doing this in the PROAC software. I'm going to go right to a presentation mode and that we're going to start the description from the effect of the overall incident. There was a catastrophic failure of the NASA shuttle program in which we lost seven astronauts, which is obviously the biggest loss of the entire uh, disaster, and there was a 32-month delay in the shuttle uh, program. However, let's look at what caused the vehicle to break up. So how could we have had that explosion? Well, it could have been related to the three major components of the shuttle itself. The vehicle, the crew cabin, the solid rocket boosters, or the main fuel tanks. You'll notice here the scale for these confidence factors in the lower left-hand corner go from 0 to 5. A 0 means that with the evidence we have, this is not true. A 5 means with the evidence that we have, this is absolutely true. And then we can provide our evidence by double-clicking on any of these blocks in the form of a verification log. For this uh, verification, we used unmanned video surveillance tape review. And the tape review reveals from two different camera angles that there is evidence of a leak of the solid rocket boosters between 270 and 310 degrees. So keep in mind as we go through here, and we'll touch on verification logs uh, here and there, uh, but each of these is backed up with hard evidence and not just hearsay. Okay, how could the initial solid rocket boosters have failed? Well, it could have been the left one versus the right one. 
and obviously from the tape reviews we we know that there was the right solid rocket booster but we have to keep in our minds what's the difference why wasn't it the left it's the same design why was it the right solid rocket booster so we say how could the right SRB have failed well it could have failed at the uh, aft joint the mid joint or the forward joint and we ask ourselves again from a positional standpoint okay we know it was the right versus the left uh, why was it the bottom joint versus the top or the middle? Okay, we know from video cameras also that it was at the aft uh, right field joint of the solid rocket booster. All right, how can that happen? Well, it was either in the body of the SRB or it was at the joint. And this makes a difference because, uh, you know, was there a puncture or a rupture in the body of this uh, of these sections that were stacked on each other? or was the leak via a joint? In this case, it was proven to be a joint. So how can the joint fail? Well, it could have been an inner diameter failure or an outer diameter failure. Again, uh, telemetry data and the uh, visual observation from the reviews of the tapes proved that it was an inner diameter failure. It was from coming from the inside out. How can that happen? Well, it could have been process related or it could have been mechanically related. Evidence is still supporting that it was mechanically related. How can I have a mechanical failure of the right SRB aft field joint? Well, the strut could have failed, the casing could have failed, or the O-ring could have failed. Again, the retrieval of the parts here supports that this was an O-ring failure as opposed to the casing or the strut itself. The O-ring failing actually caused the strut to fail. How can I have an O-ring failure? Erosion, corrosion, fatigue, and overload. Again, as the parts were found in the ocean and brought back for analysis into a staging area, uh, metallurgists confirmed that there was evidence of corrosion on the O-rings. I mean, I'm sorry, erosion. How could the O-rings have eroded? Well, it could have been, remember I showed you a primary O-ring and a secondary O-ring. Uh, evidence proved here that the secondary o-ring gave way giving way to the primary o-ring to fail how could the secondary o-ring have eroded what's called blow-by let's take a look at blow-by reviewing of physical evidence past historical records and simulation modeling con tests confirm that the erosive patterns found on the o-rings were a result of the blow-by of solid rocket fuel burning at approximately 5,600 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's exactly what it means, is that the fuel was blowing by the O-rings themselves. Uh, a materials problem. I could have had a materials problem with the O-rings. The review of purchasing habits for the O-ring and the receiving procedures. Research proves that the vendor of the grease for the O-rings had changed. It was hypothesized that the moisture content of the grease may have been too high upon receipt. However, there were no inspections uh, as they were received to test for moisture content, so this could not be confirmed uh, as a contributor. That is the reason for the two here, meaning a low probability, is that they couldn't be conclusive about it with, with hard evidence. And that the launch temperature was uh, too low for that day, and we'll go into that. Okay, how could I have had blow-by? The solid rocket fuel could have been contaminated or there was an insulation failure with the zinc chromate. In this particular case, there was a failure of the insulation to insulate. How could that have happened? Uh, external impact, something on the outside impacted the inside or there was a seal testing issue. Let's take a look at the seal testing issue. A review of the O-ring nitrogen purge testing procedure. Uh, a review of the procedures demonstrates that the pressure used in the nitrogen purge test was increased recently. Well, why was it increased? The procedure was either correct for the application or it was incorrect. In this particular case, uh, the modified version of the original procedure called for increases of pressure from 50 to 100 to 200 psi. This modification, though intended to ensure a seal of the O-ring, actually was causing holes in the zinc chromate insulation and creating a path for the solid rocket fuel to leak. 
So while well intended, it did not turn out that way. Okay, so why was the procedure incorrect for that? the application? The nitrogen test pressure was increased and there was no management of change to review the effects of that change. Okay, so now let's follow the other path. Low launch temperature. Let's look at this for our verifications, a review of the weather conditions at the time of launch. Records reveal that the launch temperature was at 36 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 15 degrees colder than any other launch. Why did we launch in spite of that evidence? A review of the teleconference, excuse me, a review of the teleconference at pre-launch between Cape Canaveral, Johnson Space Center, and Morton Thiokol, the manufacturers of the solid rocket boosters. In order to launch, Cape, Cav Cape Canaveral, Houston, and Morton Thiokol must all agree to launch. Morton Thiokol vetoed the launch from the beginning because of concerns about the effect of the O-ring elasticity. Thiokol held, the position, held this position until minutes before the launch. This is when NASA applied uh, implied pressure, like, are you telling me that your product does not meet spec? Such pressures forced the reversing of the Thiokol veto and allowed the launch. Why would people do that? Why would they make that decision uh, and to be able to reverse it? There was no launch temperature commit criteria. There was nothing that said that they could not launch below uh, a certain temperature. So there was no violation of policy at that time. Uh, if you will remember back, it was, uh, this was during the reign of Re President Reagan. And President Reagan was to be speaking the next day at the State of the Union. And what made this particular launch uh, popular was the fact that we had the first teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe, and she was to be talking to President Reagan. So there's an implied pressure there. Well, you know, we can't talk to her unless she's up there. Uh, NASA cannot meet launch schedules. There was a, um, a pressure by the media and our review of the past launch histories confirms this. Uh, this was the third attempt to launch Mission 51L due to technical difficulties. NASA was trying to be viewed by the media as, was being viewed by the media as not being able to meet their timelines. And this was not helping them in their efforts to become a commercialized uh, profit center. And that's what we have here at that particular time. Uh, of the launch, Congress was lobbying to make NASA a commercially viable entity or a profit center. This would mean that they would be tasked to chain to charge customers to put their satellites into space. This pressure, coupled with the media highlighting they were not able to meet their launch schedules, added more implied pressure to launch that day. So when we look at these all together, the LR here is a latent root or a systemic root, the HR is a human root or a decision, and the PR is a physical root. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to engage a feature here called path to failure. And what we can do is we can see how the systemic issues pressured a decision which triggered a series of physical or observable consequences all the way up until we had harm done and uh, damage to the vehicle itself. So this is a good way of communicating graphically with evidence uh, cause and effect relationships from bad systems to bad decisions to bad outcomes. This will conclude our Challenger overview of the RCA and the logic tree. For more information call Reliability Center at 1-800-457 0645 or visit us at our website www.reliability.com. Thank you for your time.